yes yes okay so first of all uh, like my topic is the role of educator in enhancing competency of uh, students uh, to start with i'm not here to tell you how to teach okay we all are uh, competent uh, as a faculty to do our job okay what i will tell you that what i'm doing it here uh well as uh, dr jain said that i'm i'm uh, i'm a faculty at medical college of wisconsin here and um basically i teach pharmaceutics that's my area of expertise and i have a limited experience of teaching in india so i and, and that's a long time back so if i say something uh, you think is kind of old and um, redundant please ignore i apologize in, in advance so and also i'm not trying to compare two systems right every system has a plus and minuses what i will give you an idea what i do here when i teach and what is the role of uh, a teacher or a faculty in uh, basically enhancing competency of um, your basically any students so when dr jain invited me kind of regarding uh, in the context of the new education policy well, i went through the document and i was so happy to see that the kind of changes which are proposed i think these are very important changes and uh, i believe that if these things were uh, kind of implemented in a right way it would uh, do great to the service to the pharmacy and other kind of higher education uh, purposes so with that i will start my uh, lecture today or my discussion today what i can do is that like i don't believe in monologue between audience and speaker so after some slides i will stop myself and feel free to ask me any question obviously i don't know everything i'll try my best to answer uh, answer any of your queries and so that way we can maintain a dialogue i will i am more interested uh, having this session as a discussion so that i can help you answer your question than kind of telling you what to do or what not to do that's not my job okay with that so what is kind of a main role uh, of a faculty or a professor or a teacher is right so the way i see it is kind of a, a trimurti or a trinity right having what i'm trying to say here is that a faculty has such a power that it can change basically how the student learn something okay but when you see a faculty what you see you see a person or a power but three different roles so one role is teaching obviously very important to give knowledge second is research like it's very important to engage in some kind of research research is like a flow of water the water keeps flowing it keeps it pure so when you do research it helps in teaching and when you do teaching and research the, the teaching also helps in research because it keeps you keeps your basics very strong the third thing is service uh, i have no idea how things are nowadays uh, in india so somebody can educate me but basically we as a faculty we have three important role to play teaching research and service and i am kind of showing you in the form of some kind of trinity or today and what so you can say with one power which is the kind of faculty so uh, we as a faculty can give a lot to the system by doing three kinds of a job in a proper way my main focus today would be on teaching how our uh, efforts as a faculty can help student to do better or increase its competency or can help to attain all the student learning outcomes so that's my main focus would be so i believe like a teacher is like a dna you know the dna basically she preserves and passes information on to the next generation that's what we do as a teacher right the, we are doing the job of dna 
the DNA, RNA, what they do. They take the information and pass to the next generation. That's how it's surviving. Similarly, as a teacher, our job is to preserve knowledge and pass on to the next generation. So it's a very important job, which we do as of now. But the way we are doing, we have to understand. So I'll give you an example. I teach pharmaceutics, like uh, and uh, in that I have a section called drug delivery system. So when, when I start teaching that part, I tell a student a story. It's a fictional story. It's not a real story. Saying that uh, when um, we thought of, you know, scientists thought of going to moon. So there were two approaches. One set of people said, why not collect 10 million people or like a million people in big area and throw all of them towards space and thinking that few of them will have enough escape velocity to cross the atmosphere and someone will end up landing in moon. Second set of people said, no, no, let's not do that. That's a very crazy idea. Why not build a rocket or some kind of spaceship, put a GPS so that can take you from Earth to Moon and put a couple of people there to basically navigate the whole thing. That's how we landed on Moon, right? But what's happening is that our teaching is like the first way. We go to the class, throw our knowledge, thinking that it would reach somewhere. Is it reaching? We don't know. And that's a very important thing we need to understand. That providing knowledge is fine. You come, teach, your, take a class, teach what you want to teach. You might be doing a great job. But is your knowledge reaching the right area? So targeting of teaching is very important. Not only one, what I'm saying is a multi-step. The way I see, I see as a multi-step targeted teaching is very important for a successful outcome or to enhance student learning outcome or make them more competent. Why? Because you think about, so first, first of all, when you go teach what you see, you see a group of students, right? Are they all same? They all come from different background. Like here, uh, there's no B pharmacy, there's a farm D doctorate of pharmacy. So uh, students come here after their bachelor's degree. Okay, they finish their bachelor and they come for doctorate program, either farm D or MD, like doc. MD means doc, doctor basically, uh, and PharmD for pharmacy or PhD, all those kinds of stuff. So they come after doing their bachelor's. And even in India, if students come for your B-form course, they all come from diverse background. Somebody is coming from math background, somebody coming from biology background. They have different level of understanding. Do you think that the one way of teaching will help them? Like when you come and tell something, it will help them. It will never help them. Right? And that, and that will lead to inconsistent and unsatisfactory learning outcome. So you're working hard to teach, but nothing is coming out of basically. If you if you honest and honestly, if you see their performance, uh, what you would see then the way you are teaching or putting efforts, nothing is coming out of it. And why? And uh, that's very important thing to understand. And I remember like when I was a pharmacy student at that time, I have no idea what happens now. Uh, there are students who came from maths background or biology background. I have seen biology students struggling in maths in first year and literally having nightmares. And uh, maths students having nightmares about learning biology because they all have diverse background. So you cannot expect everybody to react in a particular way. So that's very, this is, this is the first piece we need to understand. 
that students all what you're teaching have a different background and different level of understanding. So one way of teaching will not work. So what? It is not that student is dumb or cannot understand. Every student can learn. Every student can learn. We were student, we know that part. But just not the same day, not the same way. That's very crucial. It's not that there are some learning issues. There could be with very rare student, we may face that they may have some kind of learning issue. But most of the student, the issue is not about their capacity to learn. Issue is that about how they are being taught. And I'm not trying to say the folk that all the responsibilities on teacher. Students have their own responsibility. I'm not discussing that. But as a professor, you need to understand, first of all, your students are not a homogeneous population. That's the biggest mistake we do. Thinking that this set of, I don't know how many students are there nowadays, 50 or 25 or 100 sitting for your class are some kind of homogeneous population that when you come and teach and they will learn. Truthfully, I remember myself being a student, Miss, we were lucky to be taught by very good professors, very big names. But I wouldn't lie, Miss, uh, many times I couldn't understand what's going on. Miss, I was an okay student, I was a good student in a sense, I used to get good ranks in my class and I remember sitting on my back bench and writing poetries because their lectures I could not even understand what they are teaching. They might be teaching good job and I may have some deficiencies, fine. But we have to understand as a professor that every student sitting there is not same. And there's nothing called students. There's no homogeneous population of students. So we have to get away from that. That's the very first thing I learned very long, long time back as a student and as a professor also then. So what what is student view? So I, I kind of, I proposed a new classification called 20-60-20. Uh, so what is 20-60-20? So I kind of, uh, sorry. Uh, I have, a, a second. give me a second. So I have kind of proposed a classification here about the student categories here. So I'm saying there are three kinds of students. So 20, 60, 20 rule. 20% 20 students are self-sufficient students. Students who are good students. They don't need help from professor that much. Basically they are, what the way I say is called self-propelled students. Give them the syllabus, give them the books, and they will just listen to a lecture and they will do a great job. 20% student. Then we have 20% student, which I say distracted student. Typically a backbencher, you can say, but not I believe in backbencher. I should sit in the backbench. So I was a good student, hopefully. So, but the 20% student who whatsoever you do, they don't improve. Difficult to, like your simple way of teaching will not affect them. They will not gain anything from your lecture basically. Now, remaining 60% student all easily motivated. This is a bulk of the student. These students are most vulnerable. Other two categories of students are very rigid. No, 20% good student, even you teach bad, they will do good. 20% distracted student, even if you teach good, they will do bad. Nothing, you, you can't do much basically. You have to create some extra things for them. But 60% students, which is a bulk of your class, are easily motivated students. What does it mean? It means that your small help, your small extra step will give them big, big jump. These students are vulnerable students. So your efforts, are going to pay most for the second category. 
which is approximately 60% of the class. So your slight kind of a connection with them would literally change their performance in the class. So first thing, when you start taking a class, when you go first time, you know, first time, means first year, in year two, you know, after a few exams, which student in which category. Issue is that how to find out is what is kind of a classification of your class. That's a very first step you have to do. Evaluate your audience anyway. Like when I'm coming in, when I was asked to give a lecture here, and just now I asked Dr. Jan, who is my audience? Am I teaching to faculty or am I teaching to student or I'm teaching to administration? Because that changes everything. Or whenever you're going out and giving a talk in any conference, research, scholarship, uh, teaching, I don't, I don't care. First thing, the first rule is that evaluate, find your audience, who the audience is. So in case of teaching, you need to find what kind of classification your class is, because that will help you to find a right approach to make all the student competent. So this thing, why I'm trying to say this classification, you have to understand. And we all do this mistake. We try to uh, understand our performance in the class as a professor by this set of students called self-sufficient. And my theory is that these students would do good irrespective of any professor. That's not a measure of your teaching. My thing is that the measure of teaching comes from this second and third category. Because they need you the most. It doesn't mean the uh, first group doesn't need, they also need you. But they would perform great irrespective of your contribution. Second and third group. If you change their performance, that's a measure of your caliber or anybody's caliber. So first thing, student, not a homogeneous population and find, evaluate your class and see that what kind of classification they are falling into. So now once you classify, right? Like you classified and you found uh, in your class that, okay, I have this kind of distribution between these three categories. And then you have to keep an eye, okay? And uh, uh, Miss, I have noticed that while teaching, you can see uh, that whether the student is able to understand what you're teaching or not. And that kind of helps. So the idea of uh, targeted teaching, my idea is that the way I'm going from is that first find your target, know your target, and then start targeting. So targeted teaching is a multi-step targeted approach. How we do that? So one thing is first thing, like practically what you go, you go teach, right? That's fine. That's one way of teaching. Okay. Second thing, when you teach something or think yourself as a student, right? When you done with class or something else, do you remember everything? Or after exam, do you remember everything? No. What you remember is concept. So concept is the kind of soul of your teaching of that day, basically. So once you're done teaching, that's the one way of doing it. It's the first step. Second step, what else you're doing to reinforce the concept? The concept which student would remember, even your class is done, even after your exam is done. What should we do to reinforce the concept that they don't forget? Not only for exam, even for their careers. Third thing is regular assessment is very important. Miss, <clears throat> and Miss, I have no idea how things work there as of now, but when I was a student, I remember giving exam once in a year, that in summer, you know, and we should, we will have sessionals and all those things. So sessionals used to go good during exams, whole year syllabus you have to remember and give exam. That, that's, that never tests anything. That's just test you how much you can remember. 
uh, I think things might have changed now. But what you have to do is that it's not about the final exam. You cannot test a student in a day, in a year, and think that you will know that student's real potential. An exam is important. I'm not saying that, but you have to find a way for a regular uh, summative and formative assessment. And that will give us a clear picture for the student, how are they doing? So these are the three main things you have to basically follow for a multi-step targeting approach for teaching. And the motto is not about that, okay, uh, that uh, not about how much knowledge you have. That's fine. Like when I start my first class, I tell my student is that, see, I know I'm smart. I have done in my career. I have enough respect, name, everything. I'm not here to tell me, tell you how smart I am. I'm here to make you smart. So my duty is not only to provide knowledge, but make my students knowledgeable. Again, my first principle I told you is coming back. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not a, it's, it was never about you and me. It's about the students. Knowledge is fine, but are, is your audience or are your students are knowledgeable? That's the right way of understanding whether teaching is good or not. So it's never about you. It will never be about you. It's always about students. So keep that in mind that you may be great researcher or great, you think you're a great orator and whatsoever, but until unless your student don't understand, if knowledge is not passing from you to your student, it means system is not good. It's almost like a Russian system in India long time back when something goes and everything leaks out and literally nothing leaves, uh, reaches the right person, right? So you have to find a way to see whether you are able to transfer your knowledge to make your student knowledgeable. So I'm coming to teaching. Does anyone have, has any question? Let me stop here. And let's kind of, if someone has any question, I will try to answer. But you hear Dr. Jain, you are more. Participant directly interact. Yeah, ask questions. You can. Either question or your input or your suggestions like that. Because we all are teachers. Yeah. So it is a kind of discussion rather than lecture. Sir, the points uh, that you mentioned here uh, in our college, now we are implementing PCI syllabus and the things are getting clear to me that uh, you said uh, there should be continuous assessment for the student, not the uh, final exam. So here they have added continuous assessment part. Then semester pattern students have, so they have a small part of syllabus and they, mm -hmm. they are going to evaluate it on that basis only. So most That's of good. the part uh, or points are covered by PCI syllabus. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Because it doesn't make sense that why should I remember whole year? Yes. How does it going to help me? That was a very old way of doing system. Actually, <clears throat> uh, we do like uh, uh, ours is a doctorate program. And we, ha we don't have even semester. We, we have sessions like quarterly system. And there also we have three exams. It's like a 10 week session. There are quarterly exam. Even for 10 week, I never do a, a final exam. Like, like week one to three exam, week four to six, week seven to 10. Because if student learns something, take exam. That's done. Because how does it matter you remember after three weeks or three months or one year? You will eventually not remember anything after exam. A student will not remember anything after exam, right? Yes. What they remember is concept. Yes. So one thing is knowledge is like exam, we read, but the soul, the concept should stay with them. And that's very important because when they go out for a job or any kind of experiential thing, that concept will help them. Yes. What they remember will never help them basically. 
Right. Even our principals are also suggesting that uh, give their give them some practical case studies uh, yeah. for understanding. This will experiential be education, case based studies. These are very important things because that's how they learn. Like I don't remember from my pharmacy education, I have used anything real whatsoever. I learned like learn, learn, like exam learned. I believe that maybe five percent I might have used it, and it's a waste of time for everybody. Annual uh, uh, exams. Yeah, yeah. Annual exams and these exams, the kind of questions we were answering in exam has no value. Yes. It never helped me in my either research career or academic career or any career, basically. It was just an exam. So this is a waste of time. Means, uh, um, India is, means people need to understand that India is the oldest civilization uh, in the world. And we, the, our ancestors has done a great job. Okay. So it's nothing new. We could have done again. Only thing is that we have to fix how we teach. Yes. We have to bring quality and expose best student to. So <clears throat> how good a student you are doesn't matter until less. the seed without the proper soil has no value. You, you might be a good seed. But if you don't get a proper uh, soil, proper water, you will not grow. And you have to be in the right place at the right time. And that's what we are missing in India. Basically. So many talents are going waste just because of the way we teach them, the way system works. And that needs to be changed. And the new policy I saw is very great for that. So thank you. Yeah. Dr. Bittal, Bittal Bandare, please unmute and ask the question. Okay, he has written the question in the chat box. Can you tell me a question? Oh, there are seven chats. I, uh, let me see. How? Okay, okay. Sorry, Ashwini. Yes, yes. Dr. Gupta. Hello, Dr. Gupta. Uh, uh, sir, the question is, uh, how important is the requisite knowledge in student? So, so when they say prerequisite, in what sense? Depending on the subject. For example, I teach uh, is very important, right? So depending upon if somebody is teaching biochemistry and all, so the basic in chemistry is very important, right? Otherwise they will never learn. So I think like when we admit a student uh, in pharmacy program here, we see the GPA of the student and we also see the science GPA. There's a prerequisite GPA. So where we pick few subjects, which we think are very important for pharmacy education. And we see the GPA in that also. And that's a very main piece. And also what we are trying to do is that we're trying to correlate the admission criteria from the performance. And we always notice that the student with good prerequisite GPA end up performing very well. So it's very important. But like course like pharmaceutics, which I teach, you know, um, in, in pharmacy profession in the US, uh, it becomes very much clinical. So interprofessional education is a lot of value. Like I, I, I teach in, I, I'm a professor in medical college. So I teach medical students, I teach pharmacy students, I teach anesthesiology students. So all students come together and learn. So IPE is very important, interprofessional education. Okay. But pharmaceutics is the only subject which only taught to pharmacy students. So there's no prerequisite there basically. Right, because that's how it started. But other basic courses, I agree, prerequisite knowledge is very important because without the basic knowledge, they cannot build on the advanced knowledge. But I think, uh, I think uh, when the students are ended from class 12, that kind of creates a problem, right? Because they're just coming after school education. So, yeah, I don't know how you guys can help and screen the student for admission. Uh, students are still like both can join pharmacy school from biology and math or only one? Yes, sir. Both student. Yeah. So that kind of a, yeah, you, you get some student who from biology background, who understand biochemistry and the other thing better. And the math student will and understand any kind of chemical engineering better. So that's kind of a 
problem and i think hope there should be a way to address it because many of us who were student and you all were student like me and you, you have noticed that how a math student struggle in biology in year 1 and biology student struggle in math in year 1 and that's not a good scenario we have to provide them more resources to be successful uh even uh, pci in pci syllabus they have added remedial biology and remedial mathematics subject so that yeah. will help uh, students to have at least some basic knowledge regarding this uh, mathematics and biology yeah that's in good. first year they have uh, for one semester uh, this subject is there remedial biology and remedial mathematics mathematics that's good yeah and and pharmacy is a unique field means unfortunately again see if i say something don't take anybody no offense i'm just giving you know, an honest opinion so nothing is about indian america here i'm also a proud uh, indian by birth so kind of very proud of being indian so don't take in that way but i felt that the pharmacy education in india is not properly rewarded right uh, it's so much the doctor uh, diploma in pharmacy and bachelor's in pharmacy and there's so many degrees and that's the right, not a right way of the treating the pharmacy students and it's polluting the whole pharmacy atmosphere i think uh, and uh, not, not nothing against diploma in pharmacy but anybody with diploma in pharmacy should not be prescribing drugs basically no no not be dispensing drug first of all they have no knowledge of prescribing and dispensing drug india is facing a, such a big antibody resistance problem we are not knowing and i know many pharmacy doesn't have any pharmacists sitting there so we know all the situation but i hope uh, with new policy change these things needs to be changed i think that all the faculty should fight for saying that this is not right right that uh, some uh, means medic medications are given by somebody who doesn't even know what they're giving uh, i always tell people even my students when i teach them you are paid not for knowing what to do you are being paid to know what not to do because anybody can prescribe medication if doctors write uh, some medication any person can do that but what not to do a pharmacist knows okay so until us we understand that nuance that responsibility is for what not to do right not what to do and that hopefully uh, the pharmacist uh, profession in india should come together and a common platform and can fight for it saying that that's not right okay okay i'm sorry i'm digressing for my for the topic so okay i'll move on and if you have any question you can stop me and put in chat so teaching okay so when you said teaching is what means all right the way again i don't know how things are done now what i have experienced i'm telling with lecture is a monologue monologue between a professor and 50 students sitting there and that's not good that monologue never helps it's a one way communication but due to smart use of technology we can create dialogue between professor and student again i said it's not about your knowledge it's about making your student knowledgeable so how can you transfer your knowledge without leaking out and that can be done by creating a dialogue between you and your audience okay it can be done by various ways a very cheap and simple way is that let them ask questions like when you teaching them make sure your students have no fear of asking questions that's the first thing i tell my class when i start my session i said the difference between dead and alive is that ability to ask question so ask me any question ask me in the class after class any time i will try to answer but ask question that's what you are here for so creating a dialogue between you and your student is very important how to do is there are various ways like first thing the cheapest way is that encourage them to ask questions anyway so obviously there is a didactic teaching which we mostly do all of us do second thing is 
group discussion so apart from you allow them ask question find a way to let the student work sit in a group and discuss like as i think dr shikotla was telling that pcl and your uh, sorry if i say a wrong abbreviation i'm out of i'm a education from india for many years pcl right it pcl and your college are doing like a team based something like this activities or something like you said so group discussion is very important create group within your class let them discuss let them discuss it comes give them a case based problem okay this you teach them how they have the time and give them a problem to solve if you cannot do in lecture hour do in lab i do in the labs and i will tell you how i do that so give them let them discuss let them come out with solution get let them let them fall but let them try because until unless they don't think they don't discuss how would they solve the problem right because at the end what you want you want them to go out and do something good if you don't know how to solve the problem how would they do it so group discussion is very important and you have to involve as an outsider there let us to and discuss and then you keep on coming to them one thing is that we have to find a way to correct this student right sometime the fear of reaching to professor creates a big hurdle between professor and student it never helps because i like I mean sometime i joke with my friends here and say when i was a student i used to fear my professor now in america i fear my student so i'm kind of <laughs> both side i was short sighted but i don't think if your students fear you it's a kind of any kind of badge of honor i like my student to come and talk to me and ask me even tough questions because that's how they learn so teaching very good the way you are doing we all do allow group discussion lab right so it's very important the lab part so like uh, uh, there is something called teaching so teaching is like a faith right but you teach theoretical knowledge like a faith somebody tells you you have to believe it right but you have to understand country like india depends upon experiential education okay pramana pramana based education was our history right that's what we do in the lab okay student learn most in the lab compared to what they learn there okay so it's very important what they do in the lab most crucial part second thing make sure the same week so you have to make sure your lecture and lab same week do the same thing more you whatsoever teaching let's say on monday on the same week or if you have lab make sure you do similar thing in the lab also that's what what they learn they experience so they they know what you tell them is is could happen but by doing experiential education same week they learn and the student when see things happening that creates interest oh wow this is oh what i have been taught what is written in the powerpoint slide or my textbook in black and white it really works it really happens i can see things happen and that's how you generate interest with those students basically so that's very important and i will show you how my labs are and my class setup not this i think nowadays india has a better infrastructure than us i have noticed so but i'm just showing what i am doing so i'll show you that and then we use lot of active learning tools a like technology to help communicate with students and just remember the names bright space tosri and panepto and i will explain you as i as we move on so what i will do is that i will try to show a second right my classroom the second is moving oh, sorry it's here just a second can you see my screen Uh, yes, Jain, yes sir yes sir okay i'm showing you how my uh, how my classroom is there so let me show you my classroom this is how my classroom is there so this is not like a auditorium kind of a system it's not like we are in a somewhere high pedestal student is sitting down no this is not how the system is. in my school is there so we have this system where everybody in the same floor 
student and professor both and you can see that if i can move my stuff here so this is the podium podium let me move things can you guys see what i'm showing you here or so this is the classroom my classroom basically how it looks where i teach and this is the podium you can see here so this is a podium where professor or any person sits here and you can see that it has this this podium has everything all possible technology is there you can see that and students sit like this very much next to the professor here they all sit next to them okay and you can see the screen is all over the places uh, where i sit and all over the walls all side of walls there are screens screens everywhere okay see all of them what happened something happened hello everyone's there yes sir okay something came like recording in in, in progress uh, maybe sir has begun uh, recording of the session okay. okay and you can see that uh, apart from all the technology here we have a typical boards also we use here it's not like we don't use boards like sometimes we use boards everything right and here you can see that while i teach i move on the whole area i don't sit in kind of one place uh, this is a kind of view of the whole classroom you can see that if i'm sitting here i'm moving around while i teach i don't sit in one podium and teach i move around and while i move around i can literally see in the student eyes whether they understand what i'm teaching or not so it's a very kind of it's very easy for communication uh, it really helps uh, for a student i can literally see if they are in the facebook or they are doing some shopping or something like that i can literally see and main main thing is that is a direct eye to eye contact and that really helps for student to understand that professor is watching me while i am sitting in class because my classes are three hour class we teach in three hour block non stop we give 10 minutes break after each 50 minutes for three hour block we teach non stop so this is how the classroom setup is there i can show you and i will show you my lab setup now so you understand so can you see um, this new slides i'm showing you yes we can see oh, perfect okay let me okay so this is how my lab setup is there so this is the lab setup and i'm showing you the 3d uh, upper view here here are for my compounding lab non sterile compounding goes on here and when they come here this side this is the sterile lab all the foods are here this is the benches where they practice before they going in the sterile hoods so i never send my student directly like when they for go for lab i don't send them directly to do the experiment or what sort of compounding they are doing first we show them a video before the class they come and see then in the class we demonstrate because expecting student to know everything and coming in the lab and doing experiment just because somebody give them a method then what is what is there to teach for professor we don't do like that actually i don't do like that i first before the class starts the class start i demonstrate what we are planning to do on that day my technician my lab coordinator does shows them everything and i provide a scientific background to that saying that why we are doing what we are doing what is science behind it what you should look while you are making all those things and then when then they come inside for the non sterile compounding they do it here sterile compounding here are the hoods but before going to hoods they practice again before gowning and garbing because once you make injections and all those thing you have to wear all kind of coats boots 
head scarves, everything else to go and make inside. But first they practice, then they go inside. And this side is for telehealth. So we also training pharmacists for telehealth, like all the telemedication. So how to prescribe medication by phone and how to deal with all kinds of stuff. This is how my, uh, my lab is. Uh, let me show you a further. Okay. This is kind of. I'm just trying to find. Give me a second. So let's go from here. So this is the kind of a compounding lab. If you can see here, this is a compounding lab, non sterile compounding basically. We have some simulation also goes on, some mannequins are there. So here they make all kind of non-compounding. Each table has all kind of supplies, what they need for there. And this is where they make all kind of, you know, compounding formulations. And when they have to make something non-sterile, basically they go here. So let's go back. This is what happens when they come here. This, these are the benches. You, you can see here, these benches, they practice before going inside the hood. I don't send that directly into the hood. First, they come here and practice the techniques here. And I have technicians and other pharmacists standing here watching them and teaching them the techniques. So they practice everything on the IV bags, all the injectables here. Okay, and then if you see here, they, this is a very real simulation how pharmacies are in US. Here is basically uh, the double door. They collect all the supplies from here and clean them and put in this double door and put everything there. And then they basically go here like this. This uh, uh, now the end room. This is the end room where they do gowning and garbing. So they will all the gowns, garbs, head scarf, everything here. And then they wash their hands with all the prescribed thing here. And then they go inside here. And then they wear the sterile gloves, like they have double gloves. And then if they go inside, oh, sorry, what happened? What I just did. Give me a second. Stop. Okay, I was here. So, you can see here, they go there, then they go inside, put the sterile lab, like the sterile gloves, and then they go inside where, so this is inside that um, sterile area. Here is the double door. They come and collect their stuff from there. And all the supplies are here. And then basically they go into the hood. You can see the how hoods are there. So here are the hoods. These are the horizontal hoods basically. You can see that they, they will compound things here. Bags and syringe, everything is there. Everything is very much real. Everything the way it is done in practice we teach them like that. Also, when they make, you see there's a camera here, this camera. So everything what they do gets recorded. And why we do that? Because later on, if a student wants to go back and see what technique they're using, is there any way they can see what they have done and they can fix the problem. So I give them a recording and they can go back and see basically how they were compounding everything. So they can fix that stuff. So, and after that, when they're done making formulation, they will keep everything double door and basically come go back here. And basically they go back here. They defrock, remove all the gowning garbing and go outside, take the stuff and basically provide to the patient. We also have, uh, show you these for chemotherapy. Like this is, this is a vertical hood, a similar vertical hood for chemotherapy here. So chemotherapy because what happens that in horizontal hood, air flows like this, so stays inside. So chemotherapy drug, if air flows like this, it will stay in the room. But in a vertical hood, all the air goes outside. So nothing stays in the system. 
So for the safety, all the chemo cancer drugs are made in vertical hooks like this. And they all have camera attached. And this is for hazardous drug you make using these glove boxes. So what we do is that we kind of provide them education in a very real situation. Everything like this is, this is their job. And you can see here. And then this is a telehealth area. So we, we have to teach them how to do like a telehealth. Why it's not showing. You can see here. So here everything is equipped with all kind of stuff for telehealth and telemedication. We teach them how to do all those things. So each, it becomes each chamber here and they call patient and learn. Basically what they do is that there's an interprofessional education between nurses, the physician, pharmacist, and we make case with them and uh, pharmacist sitting here and the medical student sitting in their, their, their classes and nurses sitting in their classes. They all work together and learn how to basically we make, make cases and make them to learn to make this. This is how kind of uh, our labs are basically just to give you an idea and just to tell that the whole idea is to basically make sure that they learn in a realistic situation as possible. I'll show you some pictures of my lab, if possible, just to have an idea with people. Like here, you can see that we use document camera. So if you're teaching calculation, we write in here and all the screen, you can see everything here. Uh, same here, you can see these are uh, the students and professors here. This is my lab. You can see here when the students are working because of COVID-19, they all have to wear masks and maintain distance. So it is me with all covering here. And uh, you can see all these pictures, how the labs are being done. You can see that all are sitting at some distance, maintaining six feet distance and doing their labs. So other thing during lab, I don't leave them. When they're making something, I go them and talk to them. Like even when they're titrating powder, I go to them and tell them what's happening. When you take an agglomerate, basically and use trituration. What are, they, what are they doing? How it is making a fine particle size by using force of your trituration. When they make emulsion, how it's forming. So while they're doing, this is a very important thing you have to understand. When they are doing those experiments in your lab, you have to go to each student and find a way, are they able to understand what's going on in that beaker or in a bottle? What kind of science is going on there? Otherwise, they will never understand. So that's a very important thing to do that. We engage students in very deep level. And I also do some skits. I'll show you some video when I uh, talk about that. Like a role playing, we do in classes. So yeah, here are some kind of pictures just to show that how my lectures and lab are. And uh, let's move on to the next one. So then teaching. So the one way of communication is that using learning tools, you know. So we use various student learning platform. There are various platforms are there. We use something called Brightspace. What Brightspace does is basically provides a communication interface between professor and student. It's not like a student doesn't know what professor is going to teach me today, where are his slides. If I have to ask any question, where should I go? This is basically a learning platform. And you might be having something uh, at your place. I, I don't know. And if not, I know in India, there are many companies I know they're coming with very inexpensive way of providing these kinds of facilities. So if you need, I can help you that out that way also. So what I, like here, what, like for example, in my course, I put everything weekly here. You can see week one, week two, and each week lecture calculation lab is lab. They all are different here. And then I upload all my lectures here. You know, all my lectures, all my lab, everything, all my documents are here. Any student can go and read about it. They know what lectures I'm teaching. So when I'm teaching my class, they can open presentation and start making their notes there. You can easily do that. That way they know. And also do a discussion board. 
What does it mean? Student have an option to leave anonymous suggestions or point. If they don't want to say anything in class and they want to, they have some issues, they can leave anonymous comments here. And that helps me to understand what's going on. Like some student did not understand what I'm teaching, they can say that, right? And everybody doesn't do it, I, I do that way. Because the way I'm saying is that you have to find a way to make a dialogue. Your student should have an option to come back and say something to you that I understood, I don't understand. Okay? So that's very important. So these uh, are very helpful tools. And also you can see that here is an assignment. So when I give any assignment, they can upload assignments here. Discussion board is there. Assessment, all my quizzes, I can take to this. And this grades, the system grades quiz of its own if you provide answers. So that makes very easy for me to deal with them. And then uh, in the course home, there's an option to say announcement. So if I have to make an announcement that today I'm going to do this or this exam and blah, blah, or in one place, I put announcement and all the student can see what's going on. Or I want something from them, I can put in an announcement. So these are very important tools here, which will help to calculate and to make some kind of a communication. For example, you see here, calculation practice. When I teach calculation that week, what I do that I create something called one calculation a day, right? So I kind of every day, I give them a calculation to solve of the same topic which I taught that week, every day at every evening. And next morning, I release the answers. So, so what's the word that I taught them there? I'm making them do every day without forcing them, releasing a question every evening. And the next morning, I release the answer. So I'm not doing anything. It's up to them. Some students use it, some students don't use it. But you can make them to work in a continuous way using this communication interface. So I hope if you have something, if not, talk to your administration or anybody in the administration should use it. It's very helpful. It's very helpful to create communication between student and professor. And this will benefit you in a long way. Then, anything else did I forget? And I can leave documents for them to read. If I don't have time to teach that document, I leave it there for them to read. I can release, change the dates to release and stop releasing. I can do many things here. Then these are very kind of useful tools. Then I use Dossary to teach. It's a kind of an app. Uh, basically, it's like a, a tablet. Uh, There's an app there. We have seen in my classrooms basically, right? So you would know how we teach. So what, what happens is that I take a tablet in my hand and move around. And what's all I do in this tablet? All the screens. It comes into all the screens. And I can do many things in this uh, Dossary app. So it permits, it makes teaching very interactive, not like PowerPoint. It means PowerPoint is a very 2D thing, right? Uh, it's good compared to just teaching, uh, but it helps. But these kinds of things further makes things more interesting. And uh, I can control session from anywhere else while moving around the class. It means I can literally sit next to any student and teach. And uh, I can highlight anything. So I'll show you, for example, here. You see here, I can make anything here. I can make, you know, these kinds, of, when I'm, if I'm explaining anatomy, I can tell where is, where is heart, where are lungs, how drug flows from the arteries and veins. Basically, I can open a graph here and create a graph. I can open a white page and write something. Actually, in my pharmaceutics, I teach a lot of mechanism. Pharmaceutics are all about understanding mechanism. I literally teach them all the mechanism through this. Like in the body, how drug is moving. If you give an IV oral delivery system or any way, I literally show them how drug is moving. If you take orally, how drugs are in the stomach, how intestine, how are they crossing from GI to portal system, from portal system to liver, from liver to all over the places uh, in a systemic circulation and from there how it goes to body. I can literally show them, draw them with my hand using these kinds of app. And students really like it when they see something. Everybody is not smart. People like to see things, how it is happening, right? Instead of giving the equation, 
which nobody understands i teach them i show them how it really works and then i make them to create a question out of it okay so this visual way of learning really helps students so this is all about teaching right so one thing is that you taught them did everything else okay and as i told you that one thing is learning right teaching and learning is one thing but after exam and i know as student and we all know nobody remembers anything but there's something needs to be remember is called concept if you teach something you teach miss i can talk about my subject i teach drug targeting or like simple thing like emulsions and all those things what should i remember for for from emulsion like how emulsions are formed and what are stability issue these are two practical things which you will help in your career how they are formed using oil water and surfactant what is the theory behind that and how they break stability are main things right how should we do that so the concept reinforcement thing is very much missing and you know how i learned the role of concept reinforcement i do skits in class so after i have three of the class block so i am teaching three of for example emulsion last 10 minutes i make my student to play a, uh, they do a skit on emulsion with me and that skit is this i tell them the script they just do a role playing and i'll show you example basically here and i got this idea long time back when i was student in one of the conference there was one conference in my uh, in, in my university and basically last minute i was involved in cultural activities during my student days and last minute we were asked by a professor hey can you guys make something play something like that for the people who are joining in conference the last day so i thought instead of making some funny comedy play why not make a play on the subject where the conference is there so we made last minute i wrote a script and last minute my seniors and all many help i had seen a couple of people helped we all came together and we did a script as a play on a scientific subject people liked it so that thing stayed in my mind so i used that idea so what i do now is that after each my class last 10 minutes my students play a skit on the subject and i will show you a video basically on that second thing don't forget the student 20% student who are distracted student who are difficult to learn student don't forget them they are your equal responsibility okay what should you do so what i have noticed that some student don't like to ask question in front of everyone they might have problem they feel embarrassed there is always a peer pressure right oh if i ask that question how would somebody think about me oh i am that stupid or i don't know that you know that kind of thing is always there so what i do is that every week i do a review session which is optional not mandatory for all the student it's very much optional i want all only student who on that week did not understand some things they will come and then ask me questions so always i block some time for what i'm saying is segregation what i'm doing here is that i am segregating student who have a difficulty without forcing them to segregate so they come on their own so i i kind of block our optional review class every week mainly for calculation part and i can do anything basically so student who are struggling on that week on that subject they only come for this class not more than i have a class of 50 not more than four or five student come but these are the four and five student who will end up filling the course but when they come there they get access to me one to one level i sit with them and again explain them everything and when these four or five student who all are struggling then they ask questions because they think we all are the same uh, you know wavelength they then they don't feel the peer pressure of oh i don't know this because they all know that they all don't know and that really helps basically so i tried that it is very valuable people tried it means i tried it is very valuable having an optional make it optional not make it mandatory review session so only students who are struggling they should come in that so i'll give example of skits uh, how i do skit so for example immersion let's say is i show the video here
So basically what I'm doing, I'm using a very cheap method of doing just these pads. These are simple pads, like a tennis racket. I can buy online and you can write something over here and rub what you want. So you can write your roles here and they start behaving like molecules. Basically. So you can see that this for emulsion. Dr. Chauhan, can you increase the volume of the video so we can hear? Okay. What is I will do one thing. Let me, let me, let me explain then. Okay. Mr. Can you hear volume now? No, actually you have to share the volume uh, at the, when you uh, play the video, uh, you again. I will explain you. Let me explain that. Okay. What I'm saying is that I'm asking them to have the to see the different colors where I'm saying that few of them are water molecule and the, and the few of them are uh, oil molecule, right? And people who have two pedal in their hand, they are surfactant because you know surfactants are amphiphilic. They're both lipophilic and hydrophilic, right? The few stand which have two pedals in their hand, like you see here, this girl, and then they are surfactant because they have both hydrophilic and lipophilic basically. And other students have only red or only white or only blue because they are either water or oil. So basically what I'm saying that when they mix together and you, you see that when they mix together, you see that uh, when you mix together and then shake it and leave it, what happens? You see that one side is only blue, one side is only red. So they are separate, oil and water layer separate basically, right? But, but when you add a surfactant in middle, you see double double layer, what happens that they properly mix and uniformly disperse. So I asked them to raise their pedal also to show that how it looks from above side when they form a uniform dispersion. And also then I teach them how immersion can break now. Now in, let's say they formed an immersion here now. What can help immersion to break? So then they behave like how immersion break, like, you know, when you add something into that layer separate and how like and they act like how molecules they kind of collapse with each other and they make a separate layer and then all the blue guys go one side, all the red dyes goes one side. That's how like this five or six minute skit, uh, I tell them and they do it. And that way they always remember the concept of how emotions are formed and how they break, right? And one more example I'll give you. This is about uh, Brownian motion. So when we learn about suspension, Right? Many of you, what happens with suspension? Suspension is a suspe when, when you take a large particle size solid and put in water, when you put uh, some, some kind of uh, large particles in water, you put it, they also turn down because of size, right? When you reduce particle size, they stay suspended for some time. And when you further reduce particle size, keep on reducing, what you get? You get a true solution, right? Like solution. So in a sense, solution is also a suspension, but the particles are so small that they always remain suspended. That's very important to understand. Like when you add sugar in water, it is still suspended because of water is making sheath around uh, all the sugar molecule, H plus OH minus, depending upon the charge, but they're still suspended because there's sheath around them. So they are always remain suspended. But a quarter particle size, why they behave differently? For example, when during winter you see the light coming from uh, the window, what do you see? You see the light particles, dust particle dancing, right? That's a Brownian motion. That's how suspension work. So the whole game is about particle size, right? That's very important. So what I have done is that I have taken different ball size, different balls, and explain them how Brownian motion work. There are two forces. One is gravitational force. So anything goes up, comes down, right? So larger particle comes faster, smaller particle comes slower because of the size. But in case of uh, 
colloidal particles, uh, air particles, they shock down the motion. Now, what is the pandan motion? Pandan motion is the, when your medium particle, like air particle, they play ping pong with each other. So they make a net basically, right? So small particles, when it comes down, they don't go down because they are stuck in the net. And that's how they remain suspended. But bigger particles, they can cross to the net and go down. That's why the chorus particle forms suspension. And while large particles don't form suspension. And a small particle, it doesn't even apply because they're always suspended. But that thing I explained by different size balls. So I let them play ball depending upon, see the large particle ball they're playing with it, right? See what happens. So these people are, so students are basically like a media molecule, air molecule. Like they, are, they are colliding with each other. So what happens when the large particle comes, what happens? They cannot hold for a long time because of size of particle. And then I reduce the particle size and say that start playing with each other. When you reduce the particle size, though the student is falling from their hands, they can hold it for a longer time because the net between them saves them from going down. So these, these are small, small games. Through games, basically student kind of learn a lot and it stays with them. So my student who's over, they learn from me, they never forget what sort of concept I'm teaching by just playing games and they enjoy it. And basically uh, at the end of class, uh, when they're tired also playing this kind of games kind of really helps them. So this is kind of a reinforcement of the concept. Okay. So we learned about teaching. We learned about uh, concept reinforcement. I do skit playing. I like writing skits and I, my students love it. I do it. And also, make sure to do some optional review classes to segregate those 20% distracted student and provide them extra resources. Third step, regular assessment. That's a very important part. So there are two kinds of assessment. One is instant assessment and many lab activities. And make it a low stake, means don't put some grades, but very small grades so that student don't get, you know, when you put so many grades on everything, Students just want to get the grade. They are they're focused on grade. The focus is not on basically to learn something. And that's the kind of a big mistake we always do. The system is that passing and getting grade is important than learning. Okay. So what I do is that one is I have my high stake exams are there, it's always there, but except those exams, all everything I do are low stake exams. Okay, so there are three, I do evaluation by three ways. One says instant knowledge gathering. That I do using the, second, uh, the instant knowledge gathering. So it means when you are teaching there and then, how do you know your student understood what you're teaching? That I do by playing a game with them during class called Top Hat. Top Hat is a game like I'm not sure how, you, how many of you use it, but like Kwan Bane Kravadpati. When Amitabh Bachchan give you a question and ask four questions, four answers, you pick the right answer, right? So audience can also pick the answers, right? So depending upon, so what happens is that, and I'll explain you top head as I move on. Kahoot is a free exam, free game. You can online go and use it. It is a nice music, students love it. I use for my calculations. When I teach calculation, I use Kahoot. And mm -hmm. then I use think, pair, share. So when I ask question through either top hat or Kahoot, what I do is that I make them, if you remember my class configuration, there's a table where three to four students sit. I ask them to work as a group and answer the question, not as a single. Sometimes I ask them to individually. Sometimes I ask them, okay, why don't you guys, this is a question I will show on the screen, but you work as a team and answer it. It's called think, 
pair and share thing, pair and share. That's what they learn together. So what it does is that when I teach them something there and then after every 10 or 15 slide, when one major part is done, I ask question through top head or Kahoot. What happens is that if I can see there and then whether what I'm teaching, they understood or not. If they understood good, if not, I will change my message there and then in a different way. So they learn. So that's called instant evaluation there and then. Then I do weekly called concept understanding. So I, I'm a big believer on concept. So let's say I have a classes, like I have a lecture in lab every week, but next Monday before lecture, I take quiz from what they learned last week. Just on concept. I said, don't learn, don't read too much. If you understand concept, you can answer these three or four questions before, before uh, my, my, my class. So that I take weekly quizzes. So make sure that did they learn everything and remain the concept, that the concept remains with them next week or not. Similarly, during my lab, I, they just don't come and do the experiments. I make different groups and make them to do other activities like calculations. Okay. And I use, I ask them to take quiz to, and to answer everything else. These are the low stake. I put a very low weightage on all those things so that it wouldn't affect the grade that much, but that will make them to do that. So that way they are learning every week. They're learning calculation every week in my lab. When they come, I give them cases. One group goes and do compounding. Other groups do some kind of case study or calculation. And I let them do in group. Means they literally cheat also. I don't care. But what happens? There are few students that cheat. Other students discuss and help each other. Like if there's a case or calculation case, case with calculations, they're, they're helping each other and teaching themselves. You know, peer to peer teaching works best. What I am doing is that by putting a, some small grade, which is harmful, harmless, basically, I'm making them allow them to work as a team and what they are learning from each other. And these things really help them to integrate. There are a few students, there are one or two students will misuse it. For example, they copy their friend's answers and submit it. I don't care. I, I'm for few students, but majority of them, they use it nicely. But I keep an eye. I go to each student, I talk to them. I help them to find the answer. I don't tell them answer, but I help them to find the answer. So even during lab, they're, they're learning something extra. Then obviously there are exams. There are uh, once in four, three weeks and four weeks, there are exams, which are high stakes. And we use exam solve the software. And I, I will tell you about that also. So the evaluation and the assessment is not one time. It is very much instant evaluation, weekly, and obviously end of the uh, main exams, basically. The philosophy here is that as a teacher, I judge myself by the performance of the last student in the class. Like as I told you before, that first category of a student who are self-motivated, they don't need you, basically. They will always do good exam. Second category, 60% student are vulnerable, they need your help and small push really changes them. But the last 20% student, can you make them do good? That's where a role of teacher comes very strongly. Okay, so if you improve, if I improve that last student performance, then I think, I believe that I have done my job, good job. Means we all are doing job, but I think I judge myself with that student who is about to fail the class. Can I make that student to pass the class of working with the student? Many time it doesn't work, sometimes it works. But when it works, it feels very good. So top head, like I said, top head we use, uh, like you can do multiple choice questions. Uh, you can literally take, uh, you can good grades also, uh, depending upon their answer. All students have their phone and laptop, top head in that in my class. So when I put the question in, in the screen, I can see who's answering or I can make it anonymous. I don't grade these things because I want student to answer freely without being fear of getting grade or not grade. I want to know whether they really understand it because I just do it top head after each 15 slides, I ask a question. Okay. And obviously you can do voting and all those things. So for example, this question, you can see, I asked 
this is the real answers basically for my class. So I asked question about the population and non flocculent suspension, right? You can see there are A, B, C, D four answers. 31 student answered right and remaining student kind of have different answer. B was the right answer. So basically 98% question answer, 74% give the right answer. So many of understood, but it's still 25% student did not answer my, understand what I taught them there and then. So there and then I kind of explained them again, one or two minutes more that why this answer is right and why three are wrong. Okay. So there and then I saw the problem, the main concept, I saw it. Similarly, sometimes, it backfires. You know, I ask question, you can see that only 32% student give me right answer. It means whatsoever I taught, they did not get anything. Like 60, more than 60, 70% student did not understand what I taught. It means there and then I have to literally change my message and teach another way so they understand the message. And here the reason was I just changed the unit. It should be micrometer instead of millimeter. And many students did a mistake. So I told them, be careful. As a pharmacist, when you write a unit, you should keep an eye on unit. Because when you prescribe a dose, instead of milligram, if you write gram, your patient will die. So reading unit is very important. So they learn their lesson even by giving the wrong answer. But by doing this top head kind of a thing, there and then instant, I can evaluate my teaching, my knowledge is going to them or not. And that really helps them. Then, Top hat you have to buy, it takes money, like the student has to pay top hat. Kahoot is free. You go online, go to kahoot.it. You can create questions and do that. It's a very funny thing. It has a nice music in the background. And after each question, it gives a rating. And a student can write any name. They, my students write funny names for themselves. And it is fun. So when I ask question, the background music comes of its own. And then they get 30 seconds, they can do from the phone also. And this answer of yes and no, what's the answer is that? And then I can see. And then it gives grading who is coming first, second, third, and they learn a lot. Like tonicity, smolarity. When I'm done teaching calculation, at the end of same week or start of the question next lecture next week, I ask Kahoot about the calculations and they love it. So this very and this is free. You can anybody can use it. You don't have to buy any license from that. And love it, student really love it. Then exam solve. So all our main exams or weekly exam, I do ex exam solve. What is that? This is everything done through system. They take all the exams. That's fine. Main thing is that the kind of analytical, they come out from this thing. So after exam is done, I can see that what is the score of the student, for example, what is the average score of the class. And we basically, each question, it takes hard work. We Connect each question with each student learning outcome and competencies. You know what competency they're learning from it. Each question we basically link with student learning outcome and the competency, right? So on each section, what part of the lecture, this, uh, what part of the course this question is from. So you can see that each student in what section, how they are doing and compare the whole class, how much they are doing. So you can figure out and each student get this report, strength and opportunity report. They know that, okay, I am not good at laboratory and diagnostic study. I am good at cardiac arrhythmia. I am good. I'm bad in this. I'm okay with this. The so student knows that, okay, where I'm weak, I have to work hard for my next exam. Similarly, as a professor, you get all great reports, basically, to tell you about the lowest score, average score, class score, each question. I don't know if you can see this or not, but each question, they tell us all the index is there, how each question, whole class is performing, which question, who is answering what. I can see all the data, all the analyticals after exam. Sometimes we know that this question is very difficult. Literally nobody could answer. So this is not the student's problem. If you give a question which nobody can answer, then, student, then the question is wrong. Why? Sometimes a question everybody can answer. That's fine, right? So the way I design my, my exam is that I'm expecting that there are 20% question that everybody should answer, right? But there are 20% question which only the student who are about to get good score, they are supposed to get answered. 
and then there are remaining questions, 60% questions, which everybody should who read properly able to answer something. So these uh, analyticals really helps me to understand how my exam is that and how students are doing and it will help them to talk to them after the exam. So regarding teaching philosophy, like first thing is that tell your student that I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to make any judgment to you, but help you to become competent. Allow them to ask question. Tell them nothing called good question or bad question. Question is a question. That's how you are there for. Okay. Encourage bad questions. Encourage stupid question. If somebody asks you a very stupid question also, don't say wrong. Don't say anything bad. Tell them good. I'm glad you asked this question. Because that's how they learn. Because if a student cannot ask questions, they will never learn. Okay. And self-awareness. Tell your student that having a problem is not a problem. But not knowing a problem is a problem. If a student doesn't ask for help, that's a big problem they face. So make sure that at the end, it comes between faculty and student. Is it some kind of relationship? Does your student feel connected with you? The day you make connection with student, you would see their performance. They will work hard for you. I get emails after exam, student literally apologizing to me. Professor Chahan, I bad an exam. I'm sorry. Uh, we couldn't do great. They, they're doing so because they feel that I, I feel bad that they didn't do good. So once you connect with the student, they will try to work hard for you. And that itself is a great thing. And they the performance will be better. The learning outcome will be better. They will do a great job. So with that, my teaching part almost ended. So any question for that? How much time I have or did I use all the time? Yes, uh, time. Actually, we have to start the second session. So if you conclude the things means next part within less oh, time. I noticed. Okay, I will do for the, I will do things faster and then there are not many slides left. So teaching wise, the next thing is research. <clears throat> uh, main thing research as a faculty is that do what you believe then believe what you do. Don't do because somebody is doing. Do something what you believe is very important. In India, what we are suffering as of now is a robust uh, ecosystem of research in university. We have few ITs and few AIMS and ISC. This will not help. We need strong research system in uh, university system. So make sure first when I'm going fast now, I think I've used it all the time, that train student properly when they come to you for research. Allow student to think freely Idea is very important. Uh, the idea changes the life. Idea changes everything. So encourage new ideas. That's important. And confidence. Confidence in research is very important. So make sure students have sufficient confidence to the research. Regarding practical approach, either the government or the funding institute, make sure there's infrastructure for everyone. Do right research or at, at least at the regional level, all the resources, machines should be there. Funding should be provided. At the university level, it's very important that there should be a mechanism where uh, funding is given to professors to work on. If a small amount of funding is there, find a way to control the quality of research. Don't make sure, integrity of research is very important. Doing a wrong research will never help, will never leave you. In, it, it is a waste of time, basically. Don't try to solve the problem. Every, to get a Nobel Prize. Everybody cannot get Nobel Prize. Find a doable project and solve the problem. Even small problem if you solve, it is worth compared to doing, taking some big project and fudging data. That's a waste of time. Nothing will come out of it. And again, not only solve doable problems, solve local problem. Come and find, find local problem. Nobody is coming from outside to solve your problem. Pick projects which will help you solve local problem. I saw that new education policy is helping using local languages along with English. That's a very great idea. People need to, people, everybody, depending upon where they stay, it's a good idea to learn them in their local languages because that's how mind works, you know, with your mother tongue. So when you try to learn everything in English, you lose that, in that interface, you lose the whole innovation, right? 
It's a great idea. Uh, you should encourage local language. Learn English the way you learn computer. Nothing wrong in that. It's a good idea. It's a good skill. But I would really kind of a, having a learning of the local language. A startup culture in university should be kind of a, it's a good idea where a professor can have an idea and create small companies. That's how we do. I have a small company here. I have a faculty here. I have a company also where I have a patent and trying to commercialize my formulations. And uh, we have to provide some regional incubators for all kinds of instrumentation, right? Because every university cannot have all the instrument, but at the regional level, so that all universities in that region can go and have access to all the instruments is very important. And apart from third is service, make sure service to profession, service to academic program, service to community is important as a faculty. And uh, I don't have time, so I will not kind of go deep into that. So with that, thank you. And thanks for time. Thank you, sir. After seeing uh, the digital classroom, MCW Pharmacy School, I don't think any student will dare to get distracted. And <laughs> we will try to implement uh, the things, uh, the way of teaching uh, you have said. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, it helped me. Sorry for being. Uh, sorry for out of time. I didn't notice it. Anyone have question? There was some chat. I didn't see that. So can you see the chat? If somebody can help. Somebody can, okay. No, everyone oh. is appreciating the uh, talk. Uh, nice conceptual teaching, and we should adopt so, such innovative games. Oh, please say my thanks, Dr. Gupta. He's my senior. He's had some comments, so appreciate his he here. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chauhan. It was uh, it was a very nice session, very enlightening one. Congratulations on my part. Thank you, thank you, Rajiv sir. How thank are you? you? Thank you for enlightening the teachers of uh, our country. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thanks, sir. thanks for attending.